Attention, attention please, stand by for another episode of When Humanists Attack. Welcome to another episode of When Humanists Attack. My name is Roger Kimmel Smith. Uh, you are entirely befuddled interlocutor. I'm also highly pleased to have the honor of interviewing our guest, Lucas West. Uh, I've been wanting to get to know Lucas for a while now, uh, being the child of my old friend, Chris West West, the pontificator, whom you might have seen here on When Humanists Attack. Lucas is also, I assure you, a fascinating individual in his own right. He is uh, just a few weeks shy of uh, turning 17, so in my calculations... Uh, you would have been born in aught three, correct? Yeah. Uh, and Lucas is a student in northern Vermont. Let me get right to having you talk. What kind of childhood have you had or are coming to the end too or whatever? And, and what have your main interests been up to this point? Well, my childhood has been absolutely wonderful. Uh, when I was six, we moved from a little suburb in the Netherlands to northern Vermont into the woods, into a bog. So, um, you were, so you were born over on the European side of things. Yep. I was born in the Netherlands and I lived there until I was six. I didn't like it very much over there. I don't know. I was bullied by my classmates and you think first graders can't bully that bad, but that's not true. It, it was, it was a year. I didn't like it. We moved here. Um, and I made some really good friends and I got to have the idyllic, you know, Northeast childhood of walking to the general store to get ice cream and covered bridges and bright, colorful leaves and a lot of hanging out in the woods. And I know your father uh, as a, a U.S. American from New York City, uh, but your mother is from the Netherlands. Yep, so my mom's Dutch. This- when or why they chose to come back to the U.S. I don't know. I was six. I didn't really have a say in it. But they'd wanted to move for a while. The Netherlands is not a very progressive country, and it was starting to frustrate them. Also, they wanted us to learn English better, and also Vermont is absolutely lovely. And I think my mother wanted a little more space. I don't really know their motives, but those seem like things that they've told us over the years. How have you been dealing with the the pandemic and the calamities of, of 2020? Generally, all right. The whole George Floyd situation got me really riled up. That affected me a lot more than the pandemic. My mother already worked from home, uh, mm-hmm. so we were fortunate enough to not be severely financially impacted by it. It was and has been generally frustrating. I don't, I don't know what to say. Um, school got shut down and it was really sad um, because my junior year was about the best year of school I've ever had. Um, for, the, for it to end like that was really disappointing. I'm sure. But uh, I mean, it sounds like you have been working out ways around it. You were going to tell me three or, three or four ways uh, you're consuming education at the moment. I'm a high school student, just in a normal high school, Then I'm at a technical program, uh, the Health Sciences Academy. It's a uh, two-year medical preparatory program. Wow. Uh, yeah. I'm enrolled in a dual enrollment course with UVM. I've been wanting to go into medicine since I was two. A lot of uh, people I've talked to who ended up going into medicine are like, yeah, I've known my whole life. It's always been fascinating to me, and I've always known that I wanted to be a doctor. But the, the always chance... known that you wanted to be a doctor. Yep. T- and me, can, do you have like really old memories that you've you know cherished or built up around yeah. this 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 claim of yours? Well, uh, when I was really little, I my mom we used to travel a lot because we lived in Europe and it was easy to get around Europe. So you know, if Paris is a five-hour train ride away, you go to Paris. Like you know. My mother had gotten us these little fun kits. They were these little boxes. Uh, My brothers had Lego in them. And uh, mine used to be one that had like dinosaurs, but she took the dinosaurs out, uh, covered it in white paper, drew a little red cross on the front and filled it with 
band-aids and gauze rollers and an ace bandage oh my uh, and gave me that and then i would sit with my stuffed animals and i would just bandage them up at, at the age of like four something like that <laughs> um all that stuff i don't and, know and so and so this this was you at that age wanting to be a doctor yep and i as a little female bodied and female presenting person got asked by a lot of people don't you mean a nurse no <laughs> I do not mean a nurse because back then, you know, I had the whole prejudice that everyone's taught of like nurses are less than, but actually nurses do a majority of the work. You are presently neither a nurse nor a doctor, correct? No, I am a high school student, a high school student enrolled in a medical technical program. Because that was the soonest I could do anything medically related. How remarkable. When and how did you come to feel like uh, like gender was a, a an issue or a question or a problem for you? Just to establish it, I'm transgender. I identify as a transgender male. I became aware of the fact that something wasn't right around seventh or eighth grade. I'd always been a tomboy. So I'd always been more interested in masculine pursuits. I'd always been more interested in masculine clothing. Um, what do you mean by masculine pursuits? Like, if given the choice on the playground to do jump rope or go hit someone with a stick, I would choose the latter. <laughs> I don't know. I, I always, the, the, you know, the, the, the more violent pursuits. Yep. Does that mean? Well, not even more violent. Just I, I have the fortunate position of having been a member of both the girl scouts, the venturers and the boy scouts. When I was a girl scout, I, uh, we do things like the arts and crafts merit badge and, business merit badge and i'd look at my brother who was in the boy scouts learning how to make fires and do first aid and make emergency shelters and i was like hold on i want to do that stuff and i actually started i my father helped me start an organization with a this tiny organization with three of my other friends at the time that we called the tom boy scouts we got some boy scout handbooks and manuals and did it as a group of then girls now i think three of us are genderqueer so uh, so am i hearing you right or am i putting too much into it that uh you use the phrase tomboy you know uh, it, it seems almost uh like an outmoded phrase to my ears yeah you know it's... certainly one of not of generations not your own I used to describe myself as a tomboy i was a female presenting person back then i called myself a girl who enjoyed masculine things and masculine clothing and didn't want to be seen as girly. Uh, honestly, I'm much more feminine now, years after I came out, than I ever was when I was in the closet. When did it start to move into transhood for real? I became aware that the discomfort that I was experiencing was gender dysphoria in eighth grade. Time, you know, considered to be the key moment of puberty i didn't notice at, at the time but looking back at it i really hated going through puberty and that often when i say that people are like oh well everyone hates going through puberty i'm like i don't think you mm -hmm. understand i mm -hmm. hated well, hate, the well, start hate what was it aimed at specifically Be okay so for example menstruation the first mm -hmm. time I got my period, I cried for five hours mm -hmm. nonstop. I, my mother was like, yeah, let's celebrate. And I just tears. I didn't want it. I didn't know what it was. It scared me. Mm -hmm. I hated it. Mm -hmm. And I was terrified of it for like three years. Did you ever uh, try to get the fear of it? or alienation from it, whatever, addressed specifically? No, know? really. Of, I just of... generally, over time, it just moved from fear to annoyance. Just kind of like, oh, God, there's that thing again. You, okay. did, you didn't have a coming-of-age ritual? Uh, my parents bought me a stuffed bear. I was really young, but I got my period when I was 10 decided I didn't like it and was like, wow, who can I see for a refund? 
And I didn't attribute that with any feelings of gender for a long, long time. I see. So wait, so so Macy's a 10 uh, is still considerably before you're saying mm -hmm. that you started. Yeah, I just I was just generally uncomfortable with that and the rest of my body for a while before I realized, oh, there's a word for this. And also other psychological feelings attached with other gendered things in my life. Can you unpack that? There were things, just little weird things. Like, I have this like visceral reaction whenever someone refers to a group I'm in as ladies. That I just ugh, I hate it. <laughs> um, and I just thought that was kind of like a don't patronize me thing. But looking back, I'm like, no, that was so a gender it's, it's thing. Not, it's, it's not just that you don't like the Victorian era and, and its assumptions regarding the genders. When you consistently feel discomfort at gendered traits, your brain comes up with every other possible excuse, then this is gender dysphoria and you are transgender. You try and run through any other option, any other explanation that you have. And what I was, was what able to- What were some to, of the other ones you tried? God, uh, I'm scared of growing up. That's why I hate my post-pubescent sure. body. That's the, you know, uh... Peter Pan. Yeah. Know. Hormones are making my brain weird. And that's why I'm sad. I don't like mm. being patronized. I attributed a lot of things to like, I'm not girly. So like, I don't like it when people see me as a girl. <laughs> that one didn't really make a lot of sense, but I'm like, sure. That yeah. rationalizes it and makes me not have to face the fact that I am transgender. <laughs> it, I mean, it is such a basic way of creating divisions or symmetries in the human experience. Nurses in the 21st century crying in joy about the newborn. It's a human! <laughs> yeah, it's right? just... From that very first moment. Yeah, right? it's uh, this Gender weird... is dividing our experience down the seam. I once heard someone describe it of with the like pink for girls and blue for boys of like, ah, yes, gen uh, color code your toddlers so strangers know what their genitals look like. Right. Perfect. It's that weird. Because if you look at it, so many people, the like baseline transphobe argument is like, have you ever read a biology textbook? And my response is, have you read a biology textbook that was written after 1986? What are the new facts? Well, hormones in the womb change they fluctuate and there are hormones there is um di dihydrotestosterone i think i'm pretty sure 90 percent sure it's dihydrotestosterone dihydrotestosterone masculinizes the body but the body gets masculinized before the brain does so dihydrotestosterone gives you your your chromosomes and all you know your secondary sex characteristics and your primary sex characteristics but Sometimes hormones in the womb change before it gets to masculinizing the brain and forming those connections and those neural pathways that provide a male identity. Male and female brains work differently, marginally different, a tiny bit different. Through CT scans of trans people's brains, people have found that the, the brain of a trans person aligns with the brain of the gender that they say they are, as opposed to the gender that they were born. So that's modern biological fact that, honestly, trans folks should read about. Because it's, whenever anybody's like, this goes against science, it's like, no, it doesn't. It just doesn't. There's so much here in terms of trans medicine and research into why transgender people are the way they are. And we have an explanation for binary trans people. Well, we still haven't even brush the surface on binary trans people and we haven't even started looking into non-binary trans people we don't know right now but we know that there have been examples of non-binary and third gender and gender flux people throughout all of human history uh i'd like it if you would unpack a little more what do you mean by non-binary because it sounds like you're uh 
describing it as a, a different phenomenon from from transgender as we understand it in the current moment. There's two umbrellas. There's the general transgender umbrella, which encompasses all gender identities that aren't my gender matches up with the body that I have. Anything that isn't that, that is under the transgender umbrella. Then you have binary trans people, and those are trans men and trans women. I personally am a binary trans person. I am a trans man. I just went from one side of the binary to the other. Non-binary is a second umbrella under the trans umbrella, uh, which includes people who identified as generally non-binary, which is a third gender, gender fluid, agender, uh, polygender. There's so many. Uh, yeah, the, I mean, those make me think of a person, you know, choosing to sort of aim themselves at society in such a way that they're way of life constitutes a critique of the concept of gender. I dare say to be careful with your wording because gender is never a choice. Even someone who is gender fluid, whose gender may change from week to week or day to day, gender is never a choice. You never choose what gender you are. You just are. Non-binary people certainly don't fit into the what we've said as a normal social structure. Um, but if you look throughout all of human history, non-binary people and third gender people have always been there. In most Native American traditions, they have uh, people who are called two-spirit, people who are considered neither male nor female and were considered great spiritual leaders. In Pakistan, there are people who are third gender who are considered nor neither male nor female. In Africa, there have been people who have been socially and culturally considered neither male or female and those people often hold a strong religious and spiritual role uh just because england and some of europe decided that they weren't going to include non-binary and third gender people in their social structure doesn't mean that they haven't been included in others You've learned a lot about the phenomenon, both uh, inside and outside yourself. Tell me more about what you've learned about what you described as coming out to yourself as trans, what, what that journey has been like. Yeah, uh, coming out to myself was weird. It was really weird. It was, yeah. For a while, I was feeling really unhappy just with myself. The direct feeling that I had, the exact feeling that I had, was I don't want to be me anymore. It was like something about this is wrong. And then one day it just kind of clicked. I, I asked someone, if life was a game of Pokemon, and at the beginning, Professor Oak asks you if you're a boy or a girl, what would you answer? And everyone I asked, their answer lined up with the gender that they were born, born as. And mine didn't. Because I was like, well, if someone randomly out of the blue was like, hey, you're about to start a life. You are about to start a life. You want to be a boy or a girl? I would choose boy. And that is not connected to any kind of, oh, male privilege thing. It just, I just never connected with any kind of female role. And that's saying a lot because me and my friends do a lot of RPGs and a lot of LARPing. And I notoriously always had a male character. That was because I could embody a male character. I could be a male character. But every female character just felt distant. I didn't know how to be that. And so I started looking yeah. at everything. And I just kind of had this yeah. moment of like, oh, shit. This isn't normal. If I have a friend who figured out that he was colorblind this year. He is 17. He is severely red-green colorblind. And he was like, I thought everyone just looked at stoplights and knew which one was stop or go by the order that they were in. And we're like, no, Abe, they're different colors. It's that kind of a thing because we don't know what anyone else is experiencing. We have no clue what anyone else is experiencing. And we just kind of assume that what we're experiencing is what everyone else is experiencing. And when you figure out that that's not true, that's really jarring. And you're like, oh. And then I started looking into it more and I, I did a lot of those like silly little online quizzes like, am I transgender? Like, oh, this will tell me for sure. Oh, it all makes sense now. 
And it was really upsetting. And I wasn't happy with it. And that launched off probably the worst year of my life to date because I became severely depressed, very, very dysphoric. Now that I was aware of it, I couldn't think about anything else. And just not not functioning well. And that was my freshman year of high school. God, I hope there's not a worse year than that. At the end of my eighth grade, my grandmother died. And I told my parents that I thought I might be gender fluid. But I never followed up and we didn't talk about it at all. And then that summer, I went to a summer camp. And at the summer camp, somebody asked me my pronouns for the first time. And me and this other friend who is non-binary, we're both like, oh, you can use any pronouns. I don't care. Tee hee he. Everyone use she, her. We were female presenting. But it, it was a step. And then that fall, I went to high school and I became friends with trans people. There were trans people in high school. Right. And I was like, oh shit, there are other people like me. And I told, I told a couple of my good childhood friends, uh, friends I've had since I moved here. And I told my trans friend, like, I think I might be trans. And he was like, okay, well, what are you feeling? And I described everything. And he was like, yeah, that sounds like it. The first time it came out of your mouth to your parents, you had a notion of gender fluid. You would have been around 13 or 14 at the time you were making these first or, or working your way towards making these claims. For any adolescent, the rap on adolescence is they think everything is the, the end of the world because it's really the beginning of the world. The, the tricky thing about coming out in your adolescence as trans is if you come out in your childhood, everyone's like, oh, it's too early to tell. And then if you come out as an adult, they're like, well, why haven't you shown, shown signs since you were little? Like, you can't win. People are always going to say you're either too young or too old. You're never the right age to be trans. I came out when I figured it out. I came out when I, well, I came out to my friends after I figured it out. I came out to my family when I was ready, which ended up being around Thanksgiving that fall, November 22nd, because November 22nd is National Transgender Day. And I was like, well, could it taste any? Really? Isn't that it, the day uh, Kennedy was shot? I came out to my parents as transgender. I cried. They cried. We watched a movie. We talked about it in the morning. I went swimming with my mom. I was really dysphoric. I was generally not okay. And then I was at dinner and my dad was like, hey, are you okay? And you know, when you have to say something that you really, really just don't want to say, and it's just a difficult moment. My brain left my body and I was like, I'm transgender. I remember my dad's exact phrase. He went, okay, Lucas is transgender <laughs> all right let's talk about this and then i started mm -hmm. crying and the rest of the night we didn't really talk about it we watched this weird norwegian movie it was kind of cool <laughs> <laughs> anyway and then in the morning we talked and i was like i'm trans i just i'm not comfortable with this body and my dad was like okay do you want to get surgery i'm like right now i just want to get a binder and a binder not like a school binder but like a chest binder it's a uh -huh. um garment that presses down latatas and masculinizes mm. the chest temporarily it masculinizes the chest uh, <clears throat> yeah at the cost of a certain discomfort i would have to imagine yeah uh it's very damaging i have now been biting mm. for a little over three years i've had bruised Ooh. ribs pulled muscles Ooh. i'm short of breath always and i have constant chest pain binding is not <laughs> sustainable <laughs> On this journey that you've described, you also were certain that there was doctorhood in your future. What you were saying at the end of the last soundbite makes it clear to me in a way I hadn't quite understood that trans has to be what in our scientific medical regimen we would call a pediatric phenomenon. There has been a higher trend in people coming out earlier. There's a phenomenon where trans women come out earlier than trans men. Because if we see a girl, girl playing with boy things, boy things, we're just like, ah, she's a tomboy. If we see a boy playing with girl things, we're like, something is wrong. A male bodied person who's like, I want to be Elsa for Halloween. The parents are like, oh, what's wrong with our child? But me, when I was little, for Halloween, I was Dracula and then a pumpkin. And my parents weren't like, 
March. <laughs> a lot of the trans masculine people I know, they've only really started to think about being trans after puberty hit and secondary sex characteristics grew in. And they were like, wow, I really don't like this. But there are, are plenty of people who come out later in life. We have a good friend who came out, I think, a year and a half ago. She's in her mid-50s and her son came out as non-binary. No, her child came out as non-binary. And then she was like, let me look into this whole gender thing. And now she is a fabulous, wonderful trans woman rocking the activism scene. Just, oh, I love her. It's less of a, an age thing. It's more of a when did you figure it out thing. It's like some kids know they're gay in middle school and some people don't figure out that they're gay until they're in their 70s. But it does make sense that adolescents, especially with all of the, the changes and the, the cues of puberty signaling change in the, in the gendered body, a lot of people definitely triggering. come out around puberty because a lot of because uh, they see their classmates being upset about a pimple and they're like, oh, I have a deep and fundamental disconnect between my gender and my body. You're telling me you don't? And they're like, no. In the last five or 10 years, I'm just learning sharp increases in anxiety and depression among yeah. teenagers. I attribute that to the school system. Really? Um. Yeah. Our school this is kind of a sad statistic. I've been there for three years and we've had two suicides while I was there and one while I was in middle school. That shouldn't happen. That shouldn't happen. Well, There have been in two consecutive years, two consecutive suicides. That both can and can't be specifically about the school system. In our culture and in our society, there's this huge pressure on success and on succeeding, specifically academically. And schools assign a lot of homework. And that sounds cliche. You know, I don't like homework. But it can really, really wreck you. Let's say you are a soccer player. You're a soccer player. You go to school. You go to practice. Practice. You get done with school at 3.15. Practice lasts until 5.30 or 6. And then you get home. And then you have six hours of homework to do. And you have to be up at 6 a.m. to catch the bus the next day. And then everyone yells at you for being lazy and not getting your work done and always being tired. And you should have a better sleep schedule. And why are your grades dropping? And meanwhile, you know, your friends are being mean and, you know, all the other pressures of high school while you're being told that you need to get straight A's in order, in order to have any form of self-worth. Uh, and stress is just being piled on at the minute. And if you fail, they put you in a box of a failure and a dropout. And they tell you that you can't accomplish anything, no matter how hard you try. And then you live in that box. Uh, that sounds like a critique, not just of the school system, but uh, of society more generally. There was a study done in 2013 that shows that modern day high schoolers have the same mental health as asylum inmates in the 1950s. I want to thank you, Lucas, for your, for your time, for your clarity, uh, and for indulging your, uh, your interlocutor's befuddlement. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. And thank you, the viewer, for attending When Humanists Attack all the way to the end of the video. So you must like us. So like us, you know, as they do on the on the thingy and subscribe and 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 donate and obey and join and build and um, and be our slave. Thank you so much. Until next time.